So check this out. I've got this large tabletop right here. This is a 46 inch diameter round. Look at it. It looks, it looks almost like there's no glue joints, right? This is the round pedestal table. This is a course we did not too long ago. And this is the one I actually made for the class. And I have to hurry up and get some finish on it. We're going to have our epilogue episode on that and the great reveal of the finished one. But um, this is an awesome top. It's African mahogany, beautiful ribbon top. But you know, sometimes when you're trying to smooth large surfaces like this, it can be a challenge, especially when it's disagreeable wood like this. This ribbon is actually what you're seeing when you see a ribbon figure usually is the grain switching. So on one side, you're looking into the grain rising toward you. That's the darker line from your viewpoint. And the other one, the lighter, is where the grain's laying away from you. So if you try to just hand plane the surface, it's problematic. <laughs> so you've got to come at it from a different way. Now, what am I talking about smoothing the surface? Well, when we prepare material, modern means, Oh, usually we'll leave machine tool marks. So usually you're going through a planer over a joiner and you're getting it to dimension. And you may even be buying it S3S from the lumber yard and taking the way it came through those planers, which can be kind of crude. You know, they're not giving it a beautiful finished planing. But once you've got the planer, it goes to the planer. You often get these marks from the feed rollers in the planer and even from the cutter head. You'll get these little serrated markings that are hard to see, but unfortunately, when you apply your finish, if you haven't removed them, oh, you'll see them. And so will all your fine guests. And they'll say, hey, nice job with the sanding on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe they won't even know what they are, but you'll know, and it will bother you to your dying day. So we want to get it right. Two confessions right here. We want to get it right to the, from the beginning. We want to prepare the surface, get rid of those machine marks, and get a beautiful, smooth surface. So I'm going to share with you the real deal on how to get at this. Well, let me show you this, this example here. Here's a plank. This is a piece for another top here. This is 19 inches wide. Woo! That's a single board, African mahogany, and it's 48 inches long. So this actually, this side was actually jointed. I skimmed it over my joiner downstairs, which believe it or not, is 24 inches wide. Wow. So it's an oldie, but a goodie. It's got the old Babbitt bearings, but but see the, the grain, I don't know if you can even see this, but I got some horrible tear out on this grain where it reversed here. So I still have about almost an eighth of an inch to take off this. So um, I will be doing that actually through a drum sander to get it to thickness because it's just problematic to plane this material. Now, I, I meant to go over here. Let's go over here. <laughs> okay. Camera lady. I'm following you. Here's the drum sander. <laughs> All right, so this is a 1632 Supermax drum sander. And what's nice is I got the accessory locking wheels here. So you can lock it in place and roll it around as needed. And what it has is the, the sanding head here. And that's 16 inches wide. Now the reason it says dash 32 is it's open on one end. So you could conceivably sand a 32 inch wide top through this because you can just spin it around and it's slightly open on one end so it won't gouge it at this end. And then here's the feed. So if I turn on this, you'll see the wheel start. Then I'll close it up and you're gonna always run your dust collector here but I'm not gonna feed anything so I'll just turn on the feed roller. You can see how the feed roller goes in and you can adjust the height here. So this is a good way to prepare problematic material 
rather than going through a planer if, if you have to, to finish it off and get it a little bit closer to thickness, try to remove some of those marks. So even with that, you still have to glue up the top. I didn't send this all through the sander at the same time and I had to glue it up and I had an uneven joint and I, you still have marks from the sander. You can get snipes, which are little kind of grooves in there. So I still have to really make sure I go over this whole top and get it truly flat with no machine marks. Now I forgot to mention, you can always go out and buy yourself a 48 inch wide belt sander. <laughs> no and install some three phase power and you'll be all set for that top. You might as well go into business while you're at it. All right, so let's come on back over to this board where we were. Now, in some of the other videos, I've shown you how to hand plane a surface. Well, in the description, there is uh, the link to the hand planing a surface like a flat tabletop. And I do a small tabletop there. And in that video, I believe it was cherry, so it's fairly agreeable. But let me just show you how disagreeable a material like this can be. If I take out the smoother, and I think this is the, the Lee Nielsen smoothing plane. Let's see if it'll live up to its name. If I come in here, you know, it is, it's doing all right. Let's go a little further to the right. Uh-oh. It's doing great, but I got tear, 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 tear. But it's, it's not horrible, but you can see it, right? Yeah. yeah. Tear, 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 tear. So it's not great, but you can see the low spot here and here. Now, usually I'd like to skim plane, and sometimes you'll have to do very little sanding after skim planing. And in that video, I show how to set up your plane for maximum performance on this type of thing. But um, you can also skim it with a, a low angle jack. And let's see if this does anything. I've got this set pretty fine, but I'm just seeing, that's a little better, but it's, and it's a little steeper. Let me push the blade out a touch. So I ground this to a kind of a steep bevel. So I'm coming at it at a relative steeper angle, even though I'm at a low angle plane. So the steeper the relative angle of your cut, the better smoothing results you'll get for wild figure like this. So you could handle this. That's cleaning up a little more, but I still have that nasty tear. So after that, you could go at it with a scraper. And this is a scraper uh, holder from Stanley. This is the number 80 card scraper. But this, this will give you real shavings, but it's giving me a tear as well. So then you might say, well, let me just hand hold it, try to get rid of this stuff. So I could come in here after planing and, and get rid of a lot of that tear prior to sanding. Now, that would get rid of, I'd be sure that I'm done with all the machine marks if I'm able to skim this with a plane. But you know what? In the real world, you can't always do it with a plane. <laughs> and I don't want to say do it with a plane. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you. You sometimes have to revert to rough sanding and getting, <laughs> getting down and dirty with this. And we used to actually do that at Pugs. Do you know, we didn't use hand planes that often. I only got good and used hand planes a lot more after I was on my own. Uh, we use them for finer things, like small things. But when it came to panels like this, he had a belt sander that was similar to this one. This is a this is a porta cable. Look at this beast. 
They call these the locomotive uh, type, and you can see why, right? Now, this model, this is the BB-10. Uh, Pug had the 500. It was a 500 series. And what was so nice about it is it had really good weight, and it was a four-inch wide belt on there. And you were able to belt sand this side as if you had a drum sander. So nice and smooth, the whole thing. But there was an art to it, all right? Even like hand planing, you have to get used to holding and controlling a belt sander because almost like routers, they can do a lot of damage in a heartbeat. They can really be your friend, but your enemy as well. So his locomotive, it was heavy and it was wide and it had a four inch wide belt on it, four inch by 27. And so he would just, we would just let that baby glide right on there and go all the way out. And it, what was so nice was it was a large platen. So the platen is that flat plate right under here. Now this obviously doesn't have the belt on it and this one's been out of commission for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if someone's interested in restoring it, I'll make you a great deal. But anyway, uh, this platen measures like seven, seven inches long from the, in the usable space. And that's, I'm sure it was, that was same with pugs. This is only a three inch wide here, but his was four inches wide. So you had this large flat plate that you just had to hold it, kind of balance it on there. And you could go over there and get a beautiful surface in fast time. So I remember using that on the sides of chests of drawers, on headboards, on beds, lots of pieces like that. It was a wonderful tool. Now, unfortunately, they don't have these big locomotives around. You can find them, but they're not. There are modern replacements. I was just looking up today. If I was to get one today, which I, I don't need one, you know, I've got, I don't use them very often anymore. And I have something else I'm going to show you in a minute. Here's what I have now. I have a Porter cable, a three inch by 24 inch belt. So if we look at this platen, it's only five and a half inches long and it's only three inches wide. So it's a little harder to keep dead flat as you move along. And that's where they bite you. If you don't stay flat and you just like lift a corner, what you get is like this skid mark. It's like a dig in, in the material and it's lower than everything else. And then you have to level everything around it and hope you don't get another dig in the process. So let me just show you how this works really briefly. Uh, I got it hooked up to my Festool. So let's try this out. It's, it's a little noisy, but I'm going to only use it for a minute. Here we go. Ooh. I almost had music to our ears. <laughs> <laughs> I almost had the dreaded cord catch. See, the cord was right here as I was moving forward. And if you don't keep that cord clear, I used to keep it over my arm. I, it just reminded me of old times, oh. good times. And if that cord catches, <laughs> you know, it kind of puts the brakes on the sander and you get one of those big dig skid marks. But that already looks pretty good right there. I've got pretty coarse paper on here. I think this is like 80 grit. I was standing in the porch <laughs> last time I used this. But anyway, this works great. I have found, I did do a little search. If I was to buy one today, I would recommend, if you're going to use it for panels like this, where I think it's really worthwhile, I would get the widest, biggest one I could. So it would perform like those Porter Cable uh, locomotives. The one I saw that I liked, you may suggest others. I'd be interested in what people think if they have one they like. I saw the Makita model and we have a link to that in the description as well. Four inches wide and it's a 24 inch belt. That th Those old locomotives were 27 so they gave you length, le extra length. So probably the platen isn't 
quite as long as that one. But what's great is it's 13 pounds. So that, that sander is gonna give you a good heft and a stability to just, you just glide it along and you'll get beautiful results on large panels, okay? So what good paper would you start with on that? Um, I would start with like 100 grit usually. 80 is a little coarse to start with. If you've got a lot to do, 100, even 120, but 100, I remember going over it. Uh, this is going way back because I honestly, I haven't used, I haven't used uh, belt sanders in 25 years. So I don't, I wow. rarely use them. I usually skim plane and then I hand sand because they're not as reliable. But if I was going to do it, I would definitely use a four inch. Now, uh, when you use them, it's a good idea to scribble on the whole piece and make sure you remove the scribble marks along the way and you'll be all set. And then I would just sand up to like, used to go to like 150 and I would still then lightly card scrape around because you just don't want to see those machine marks show up later. If you've had that experience, you know what I'm talking about. Um, Alan asked this question a little bit earlier. I'm not sure what he is referring to. Maybe it was back here by the drum sander, but he says, I have a 16 30 second, but I found it difficult to not leave a line down the middle when I sand the second side. Would it help to tilt the roller upward a smidge? Uh, yes. Is that Alan? Mm -hmm. Yes, Alan. There actually is, usually in your manual, they're going to show you how. You have to take the paper off and you put a little thin gauge in there and you can adjust it. Your drum should be just a smidge open higher on the open end. So it's a little bit less sanding so that when you do spin it around, you're technically, it's not lower and biting in. You have to have it slightly open on the open end to, to eliminate that. And then you come back and clean it up after anyway. I hadn't played around with this so next tool very much, but I want to show it to you because I think it is awesome and it actually can eliminate the need for a belt sander. However, I think you still might want to get a belt sander because they're kind of fun. That Makita, the link you'll see, it goes for like 330. That's not bad for a, a really good size belt sander like that. Now, this sander, this is the Fest Tool Rotex. Ta -da. Gorgeous. This is the 150. RO. Anyway, I'm going <laughs> to... Yeah, there's a link for that in the description. Too. Yeah, I did. Now, this costs twice as much as that Makita I just told you about. But let me show you what it does. So normally, uh, rotary sanders like this, you'll get that random orbit. And usually you're getting five inch pads. This, however, is a six inch pad or 150 millimeter to be precise, which is just slightly under six inches. So has the incredible dust collection of Festool, which of course, <laughs> if you're gonna get the Rotex, you also should get the Festool back unless they have others. So you're actually gonna be into it more than the just over $600 for this bad boy. But here's the feature. This is not just a random orbited sander. It doesn't just do the random orbit thing. It does like this aggressive uh, direct drive spin, almost like an angle grinder. So it has two settings. You can set it here to rough. And when I set it over there rough, listen. You hear that gear engaged? Now when I set it to the finer, it becomes a random orbit sander just like your regular, and it spins kind of free and vibrates and all that. It's a lighter grind. So the, the darker lines, that's a harder grind. So I'm gonna go with that. And this is the way you can overlap and not need a belt sander. It's, it's a little slower than a belt sander because of the amount of space it is, but it's more controllable. So a top like this, I need to go over it one more time. So I, I got it glued up and I wanna make sure I got it. I'll just do a little area here. So I'm gonna really get plenty of pencil lines to make sure I go. So the way I like to do this now is I've got 150 grit here. I only have two grits. They only sent me two grits. 
And I'm still, I'm not complaining. No, I don't think we should have. So I got 150 that. and 180. I've got, I'll finish with 220 with another sander, but the 150 with the aggressive setting is pretty aggressive to level. And you'll see how fast this goes. So I'm just going to start over here. And this is what I used on our kitchen counter. Our, and I couldn't believe it. It was, it was flame birch. And you know how that can be problematic. I couldn't plane that very well. So I just went through these grits like this and it's perfect. It looks awesome. So I'm going to control it. I like to start with it on the surface rather than come in and grind a groove. So here we go. All right, made quick work of that, got rid of those pencil marks. Nice. And that's the 150 grit on the aggressive setting. So normally I would just go over this whole top with that aggressive setting, then just keep the same paper grit on and I'm going to switch the random orbit and I'll scribble again. Let's just do it in a little area here and listen to the difference. I don't know if you can hear the difference, but. All right, so that first setting was more aggressive than this, but it, it, it's more direct drive spin, so it can leave swirl marks that are harder to remove. So if you go right from that setting to the random orbit, it removes those scratch patterns of the swirl from the original cut. Then once I've gone over the whole thing, I'll take this off and I'll go to a finer grit. I'll, I'll go to my 180. Usually I'm jumping from 150 to 220 and I'll just do that just for insurance. It doesn't take that long. And I usually like to hand sand with the grain. Just go over it one last time with the last grit you use. So I will finish with this one. This is the one I did buy years ago, but this is 220. And I just go over it with 220 and then I'll hand sand with 220 to finish. And that'll be it. And I'll break the edges and I'll finally get some finish on this baby. Pretty nice top, huh? So beautiful. Can't this is solid uh, mahogany, uh, African mahogany, right? Yeah, this is the African mahogany. I meant I should have attached another video. I actually did a uh, video on finishing African mahogany in preparation for this actual table. So that... In that, I use the stain, potassium dichromate. A lot of people were interested in that, and that actually launched us into talking about ferric nitrate. Is that right? Yeah. I think so. Which is an incredible uh, chemical reaction stain for curly maple. So check that out if you're interested. But there you have it. That's the approach. You can go the belt sander route, or you can, if you're into it, Get one of these Rotexes. They're pretty cool. And they're, they do an amazing job on tough wood, especially. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Craig's asking it. He says it, it appeared you were applying a lot of pressure. Is he wrong? 
Uh, no, I wasn't. I was sorry. I was. It's just my my muscular stature. No, I was actually trying to just glide it along. I would if I pushed down, I would have uh, bogged it down, and you wouldn't. Uh, you would have hurt a little. No, I'm just trying to glide it along. That's the thing. Just let it do its thing, and you don't want to slow it down. I, I you know, it takes a little getting used to. You saw it. It like whack out a, a little bit it gets out of balance because that's a big plate and it's moving there is an adjustment i could have slowed it down i should probably should have i was almost at full speed so it has speed adjustment you can slow it down there's all kinds of pads you can get for polishing so you can slow it down you can actually go up through grits and with other kinds of uh put compounds on there and even a final buffer you can use it as a buffer it's crazy so there's a lot of different heads you can put on there. But that big six inch wide or diameter plate, you're just keeping it flat on there with your hand here. It does come with an accessory handle, but I find it's just easier to control with my hand on top. But you almost need two hands on this thing because it's so... It looks powerful. Yeah, you can feel the power with with it on that aggressive setting, especially. All right, everyone. Thanks once again for hanging out with us for mm -hmm. just a little bit, sharing this little slice of life of creativity in the shop. I love to hear your comments. And if you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing, liking, sharing. Thanks again for hanging out with us. On behalf of the camera lady and myself, we look forward to seeing you next time. Right back here on Sharp Night Live. You won't believe the shaking of head that I have to look at every it's night. In my ear. All right, I, I toned it down there. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Good night, everyone. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us. See you next week.